We're all riddled by fear and doubt and insecurity, and we all have dreams. We talk ourselves out of those dreams. We like to see people who have been on the top and have fallen down, fallen from grace, and then picking themselves back up. I always say, there's no such thing as second chances. You get as many chances as you want in this world. It's how you present yourself to the world um, that gives you the second chance. You can continually reinvent yourself, but you've got to do it. I've never had a plan B for some reason. I'm very stupid. I've always had, a, I guess, a very uh, um, unrealistic belief that it would work out. Um, but it, it did for some reason. Half of it was just a trying to hustle up money to get down and get up on the train. And some of it was my parents. They would help me every now and again, take me um, whenever, you know, when, whenever my, my bugging them uh, sort of hit its brain. Like, fine, okay, we'll go again, for what? Because when you're auditioning and you begin, you don't realize how much rejection's um, involved in it. So you get rejected 20, 30 times, you're like, what am I still doing this for? Obviously, it's not gonna work. And it was so much work for us to get down there that they were just like, this is becoming more of an expense than anything. And so I had to figure out ways to get, on the, get down there on my own after a while. You know? And I missed a lot of auditions because I couldn't make it. But, uh, you know, and that sucked. That was a hard time because I hated missing them. I'd rather get rejected than, than to miss it. You know? Just knowing that I really love this job and, and knowing that um, I'm grateful for it. It's something that I want to do for a very long time so I'm mindful of it and I think that I kind of I try to be thoughtful about it and um, and I mean I think that's it and, and also just having a level of perseverance and always keeping your chin up you know I think with any job or any career you know you're always going to have an ebb and flow and it's going to be tough some days and it's going to be great others and I just think that if you really love what you do then you just keep moving forward so um, you know, just staying encouraged. Yeah. Yeah. Show up. That's the hardest thing. I think. Yeah. Show up. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of people that never get to that first mm -hmm. audition. Mm -hmm. Scary. Because um, it's hard to get to that first yeah. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You show up. You do your best, and you just always try to keep getting better. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it's kind of out of your hands. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> I don't want. To, I don't want to be an actor. I think when I. When I decided I'd rather sit at home watch movies and go to go to university. <laughs> I thought there's something in this. <laughs> And then I really wanted to be it when I couldn't, you know, you, you realize that you really want to be an actor when you, you can't quite get there in auditions. You're not quite getting a job and you just want it. You can feel it. I want to get in that door. Because the boogeyman's bigger than you, you don't, you don't fight back, you don't do nothing, you don't bite his toe, you don't do nothing. You just talk about the size of the boogeyman, how long he's been on your neck, uh, the color of the boogeyman, uh, the boogeyman system, uh, the boogeyman's, uh, how can I say, the odor of his breath. You can describe every aspect of the boogeyman for the rest of your damn life. Or you can bite his toe. Now, you ain't gonna kill him if you bite his toe, but toes are sensitive. There's going to be some movement. All you need is a little bit. A little bit. But you're not going to bite? Well, that's your definition of your possibilities in life. I can't bite because the boogeyman's so big and I'm so weak. Goodbye. Shit. Sorry. Not me. <laughs> Not me. Never. Just keep working hard. Keep working, because the struggle never stops. I mean, I'm in movies and television, and I still, you know, hustle and try to get the next job and try to figure out, I never know what's coming up next. And, you know, you're on this train and you just don't know when it's gonna stop, and the hustle never stops. So I feel like it's part of it. It's part of what makes us strong and makes us, uh, that actor, do you know what I'm saying? He makes it all worth it at the end. But I honestly feel like just never give up, whether it's acting or anything in your life, you just don't give up. There's times, I've had times where I've had to like, you know, I've gotten emotional about losing something or not, something not going through the way I wanted it to, but you have to keep on. Like there's, there is no looking back, you know, there's, yeah, there's things that hurt and it kind of, it's, it was sad, but at the same time, 
you, you try to find that somewhere else, you just gotta keep moving forward. It's interesting because tonight, uh, for example, I am inviting friends who got off the Hollywood dream bus with me who never necessarily were able to execute anything. You know, it's interesting. They'll be at the screening tonight for this film. And, and it's one of those things where we don't have the same level of in common conversation that we once had because life has happened for me differently. And I had to really check in with myself in terms of the team personality in me thought that, and I've always been a part of sports, that everybody that got off the dream bus with me, and what I mean by that is around the same month that you get off the dream bus and you come to LA or New York to make things happen, you get a collective of friends and y'all all start to run the audition circuit. And slowly certain people's pace slows down and others keep going. And my big thing always to those people I'm inviting tonight and to, as you said, um, those that are aspiring actors, my, my wisdom and advice was always, first and foremost, if you can wake up without wanting to do this. You have one morning where you wake up and you go, oh, I don't really want to do this. I would say get out because it's way too difficult. Somebody could ask me, um, are there moments of, of that being defined as being discouraged? And I would go, no, everybody's discouraged. Everybody calls home and goes, I don't know if you know, I should become a rocket scientist. If I should, as a woman, continue in this world of men and corporate spectrums or law or, 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 or medicine or what have you, um, people all get discouraged, including myself and asking mom and dad if I should come back home very early in my journey out here. But I think in terms of the representation part, I decided to not, and this is really my wisdom to them, to not really worry about it. My thought was, you know, if it's looked, if it's looked like it was easier for me than it was, it was because I really pressed hard at the craft the work, the acting classes, making sure that I was in martial arts, if I could add that to the repertoire box um, or the box of tools that I could dig into, if I needed to work on the piano, because one day I could play a character where I played the piano, just work on the craft and don't necessarily worry about the representation. They'll, it'll find you. The right agent will find you, the right manager, the right... Now, am I struggling in terms of wanting even bigger out of my career while there's people not where I'm at going, you look like you made it. I don't know what make it is, you know. I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm so humbled and thankful to God that I'm where I'm at, but there's always more. And so if you focus on the more being attained by you making sure that you do more for yourself, then I don't necessarily think the representation should matter. Again, they, they definitely will always find you. Well, I'd say you follow your dreams, you know, follow your instincts. Uh, this was it Stella Adler who said, in order to be in this business, you need the, what was it, the, the soul of a rose and the hide of a rhinoceros. So uh, that kind of sums it all up. You know, it's, you know, you're trying to protect that creative part of you by dealing with a lot of BS every day. And, and sometimes you get to express that part of you that's, that you wanted, the reason you got in this business in the first place. So I think people should just follow their dreams and not be afraid of failing and trying again. And, and you know, I mean, great actors, like look at Morgan Freeman, for instance, ran into him not too long ago, great guy. I mean, nobody knew who he was until he was about 50, 55 years old, right? He'd done all of these movies and suddenly he was in the Driving Miss Daisy, you know, and, then, and so there is a guy who probably had to deal with a lot of rejection and failure, and now he's, you know, one of the greatest actors in the country, so in the world. So you, you don't give up. That's the main thing, don't give up. I think with Vinny, Vinny had his, uh, his family support. Vinny also, his sport was boxing. My sport was baseball. Baseball was something that, um, you know, I remember even in high school, I was doing, as a freshman, I would be the guy going to the two days with the seniors, where I'd, sh I'd go to high school at, a, you know, 5.30 and, and run laps and do all that stuff. Like, if I had the talent, in baseball, that's something I would have given everything to. I think sports for me, uh, just the discipline and kind of the, um, you know, the ethics uh, of the games or it was something that I really associated with. That's There's a, tough a combination of so many things. Uh, also, luck mm -hmm. has a lot to do with it. Yeah, uh, it really, really does. Um, but you do have to come prepared um, during those lucky moments. Mm. Um, and so, and don't be afraid to grow. Yeah. You know. And also be really driven for the right reasons. I think it's mm -hmm. very clear the actors that are 
doing what they do for sheer passion and, and love for what they do. I know that's our case. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's very clear when you walk in a room. I think there's no um, BS, if uh, I'm allowed to say that uh, <laughs> word. Uh, you know, it, it's yeah. like there's only so much you can pretend and, and there's so much front you can can come into a room with. At the end of the day, it's it's the core of you that matters. It's it's your it's your talent that gets you further. Mm -hmm. So luck and all these things, yes, you have an opportunity, and it's what you you come to the table with. And mm -hmm. if you come to the table with the right things, the right people will notice. Mm -hmm. There you go. Wow, that was great. Done. Done. Boom. Drop the mic. That's great. No. <laughs> My grandfather was the only um, positive voice. He was the only you can do it that I got. Like, the, like my mother was not for my career. Um, many friends weren't, it's a tough business, you know, but um, my grandfather was like, no, you can do it. I know you can do it. And I just needed to hear, I just need somebody to believe in me. And that was the, the one voice. I feel like everybody has um, another life and it's really, I call it the life of your dream. You know, your dream has a reality that most people kind of separate from their present. But I, I like to say that my dream is my now. The first coat and the first law of shedding is empowering your inner self. You know, that acting is a gift uh, that is not given by man. Um, so what you just have to really uh, improve is your, your inner image opposed to your outer one. My method of combating moping is basically uh, staying, staying grounded and, and, and making sure and remembering that I'm really the one that's steering my ship. It's not a movie, it's not people, but I'm the one that's controlling my joy and happiness. For me, I don't know about you, but th there's a lot of reasons that go into what I might, I've turned down good parts before or I've auditioned for movies really that are where I should have tried harder to get them or something. But I don't usually regret it because wherever I was in my life at that point, that's why I wasn't interested in that role. It just I wasn't. I mean, I've, I've read a script before, for example, and I thought it was just terrible. And then I saw the movie. The movie was great. It was obvious that I didn't understand the script. You know, so I was obviously yeah, the wrong was... actor because I didn't get it. Yeah, I mean, it's happened to me to, to say no to films that end up being successful or the actor end up. Bringing like when, I, stuff, when, but when I turned I down Lincoln, sure. I was like, I, was like, I just, I, I hadn't heard of Steven Spielberg, I hadn't heard of Lincoln, I thought it was weird, why are they talking funny, it was like, I'm the, sick the of weird, weird movies, and then I saw the movie and it was okay. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> you turned down Lincoln, Lincoln too? <laughs> no, I mean, regrets are just like, what, you know, I'm not a person that's big on regrets, like I'm like moving forward, and I'm actually... In a way, like the things I said no to brought a certain fame to people. So, but in a way, kind of, I know my life, my path was pretty much um, meant to go into a direction of writing and directing. And, um, and I think if it, I didn't make the choices of maybe m more like successful big films and stuff. It's also maybe because I was like looking for what I really want to do with my life, which I found. So, you know, I, I, I have no regrets. I have zero. So I'm exactly where I want to be. I know that's crazy to say that, right? But it's true. I am where I want to be exactly. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to doing more of that. I think it's being able to find your happiness during the times that you're not working. You know, so much of being an actor is, is looking for work. Um, it's an inordinate, disproportionate percentage of time that you're looking for work as opposed to actually being on set being employed, earning money, all of that sort of stuff. And it's critical that you can find happiness in life um, uh, aside from the infrequent successes that, you know, you, you get as an actor. Uh, and it took me a long time to learn that. Um, you know, you obviously have to find it within yourself and, and then creating, you know, your, your support base, whether it's your family or your friends around you, and get your happiness from that and then everything else that comes into your life with, with acting is icing on the cake. You gotta love the process. If you love the process, then you're gonna, I think, be okay for the most part. Um, and the, the, square, the square one thing, it's, uh, you know, you're constantly, and you know, it's, it's always a struggle, I think. You know, there's, there's just different forms, the challenges reinvent themselves. 
um, the obstacles, and you try to you try to develop the foresight to be able to see those things coming. But um, when I get back to f f square one, it's it's you know you embrace it, and then you work diligently and extra hard to you know to get ahead, you know, in your craft and auditions or whatever it is that you're doing, writing, directing. The early success, it wasn't really success, <laughs> I would say. I, I wouldn't really call it early success. I, I, it was, I don't even view it that way. I view it as a, six years of no one wanting my stuff. And it was, you know, some random person who was very kind, was interested in the script, but it wasn't as if it was all of a sudden, I made it and I, it's happening now. So it really was uh, a six, seven year journey to selling my first project, um, which was Recount. And why I didn't give up, I think, is because I had something to say. And I loved writing these scripts, and they were important to me, and I, I loved working on stories. Um, and it just was artistically extremely fulfilling, where my acting career was very uh, frustrating. And sometimes I, and I worked, I did really some, worked on some terrific shows that I'm really proud of, but I wasn't actually getting to act very much. So even when you're working, um, you know, I would do episodes of Gilmore Girls and I would do four episodes a season and I would work on it a day or two. And that would be one of my only jobs for six months. So it's really about seven days on set f over a six month period. So what am I doing the rest of the time? I'm auditioning and trying to get new jobs, but that's a, an hour a day maybe. So really it was, it was a creative outlet for me of taking my creative energy and putting it into something where I can actually just go do it. Whereas an actor, you have to be picked to go do it and then you rarely get picked. So I just found it fulfilling, but I also um, was getting rejected left and right, um, script after script and agents, managers, production company, everyone didn't want my work for six, seven years. And I think uh, I got to a point where I asked myself, this is not going well. <laughs> what are you? What do you want from this? What What are you doing? And I sort of I ask myself, would I? And it's one of the key questions in the movie. Would I do this for the rest of my life if I got nothing in return? And I thought, yeah, I would. And then I just kept writing. And then eventually, it wasn't as if six months later, crack the champagne. It was maybe three years later that I sold Recount as a pitch. Uh, to HBO and then it just kind of went on from there. But there was a certain peace in knowing that it wasn't about um, it wasn't about selling something or success, even though I really wanted it. I wasn't I, you know it wasn't a kumbaya moment, but there was a peace in knowing that um, well whatever happens, you just keep writing. So just keep writing and that's what I did. Just do what's in front of you. Uh, sort of, you know, um you know, it's gotten easier over the years. I don't. I, I try not to travel too too often because I do have a little one also. And um, you know, it's all it's all good is what I always tell myself. It's all you know, and it all gets done. I just feel blessed about it that I continue to work and that jobs come my way and um, and and different and interesting kind of jobs. You know, I feel like it keeps getting. Um, you know, I don't ascribe to the fact that we as women, as we get older, should be sort of disappearing. And so far, I, I've, I've been able to stay, you know, viable. So, um, and I, 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 maybe it's sort of like Vinnie Paz. I refuse to believe otherwise. You know, Vinnie Paz believed that he would box again. I just believe I'll keep working. I guess you just gotta believe in yourself and work on your craft. And really, basically comes down to your ability to, to, uh, entertain people you know on, on screen if you're if you're in the film business or a TV business you know so when you get your shot you got to be ready to take it and then you got to really go for it at that point it's so funny I was talking to my wife and I was talking to another the other actor uh, the other day and I said you know the, the amount of arrogance that you have to have to say I'm gonna go to Hollywood and be an actor that I'm interesting enough for people to you know most likely pay to watch is kind of off the Richter scale but you also have to have that level of, I guess, belief in yourself to, to, to make the journey to do this. Um, it doesn't come with a playbook. Uh, for me, it has been, uh, like most actors, ups and downs. 
uh, you know, you have some feast, you have some famine. Uh, hopefully it's a little more feast than famine, and I've been very fortunate in that way. Uh, that you know, I've been able to do this for the, the better part of my adult life and not have to get a real job. Um, but uh, no, it's 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 probably nothing like I imagined it would be uh, when I was getting on the plane some 30 years ago to come out here. Like I haven't. I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've been working every year. I haven't you know, had any downtime. I've never. I mean, to to worry that you're in something that's successful. That that's going to hurt you. I mean, that's the least of my worries. It, it's usually the other way around, that you do something and you worry that no one will want to see it. Um, yeah, I've been working um, every year doing Game of Thrones, and I hope that if I choose that I'll continue to be working. There's a sort of attitude that you write the narrative of your own life and you sort of can write the narrative of your own career. There are going to be external circumstances that you don't control. There's jobs that Downtown I'm not going to get offered, you know, the roles that Tom Cruise gets offered, you know, and I know that and I recognize that. Even you need though to sometimes... jump up on a couch. You need to jump <laughs> yeah, I know. Down on a couch. I need to go crazy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I still think that I have consistently worked over a period now of almost 20, I mean, 18 years, 14 years in, in L.A. And it's only because ever since I was a child, I said, well, this is what I'm going to do, and I never deviated from that. And so even if I have a year where I don't work, I, I, I will, it'll come back again, you know? Yeah. And I'll weather those storms. And I, as I get older and I know that they're coming, then I, it's easier to weather them the more that I've been through them. Yeah. I think it's also just about, like, um, having some control about what projects you pick and let into your life, you know? <laughs> I think it's, uh, you know navigating that ship and making sure that you're on a trajectory that will have the same end result that you hope and yeah I try very hard to only be a part of projects that you know I think are cool and you know I think we've, help me. we've both been lucky that way to do things that we actually would I mean at a point in our career when we weren't necessarily able to choose what we were doing we both have done things that we would choose to do you know, so. <laughs> there's a guy that uh played football, he always comes to mind, um, and he, 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 he got like, he was always around the ball, and he played defense, so he would recover fumbles, he would get a lot of interceptions, and so people, when you would watch him, you would say, oh, he's lucky, he's lucky, you know, he's always lucky, he's always around the ball, um, but when I watched him, I said, no, I think he actually has prepared for these moments, you know, and I think it's the people that prepare for moments that things actually um, start to show up for them. You know, I was going out to a lot of directors before Crown Heights came my way. I was just calling directors and writing to them and, you know, you name the director, I probably um, reached out to them and didn't get many returns and um, probably got like two um, from people that you don't know. Um, but, you know, so it was a little bit frustrating just trying to, I just wanted to audition for something or just to let them know that I was acting. And, you know, at the moment when I stopped, when I got frustrated and I just stopped, I said, I'm not going to reach out to any more directors. I'm just going to keep training. Um, it was like a month later that Crown Heights came um, from Matt Ruskin. So it's... I think it's it's doing the work. I think it's having the faith and the passion behind it um, that sort of leads you to whatever you're supposed to be doing. You have to have a healthy ego to be in this business. You have to know you're good in order to succeed in this business. If you don't believe that you're good, you know, then then you got to go do something else because you're gonna get hit time and time again about how you look. Uh, you know, you're this, you're that, uh, you're too old, you're too, so you have to have a thick skin. And um, I, yeah, I, I, you know, just actually I was periscoping with somebody in the car before this and I said I was doing this interview. And this guy goes, hey, get me into the business. And I said, get yourself into the business. Because <laughs> it's hard work, you know. Um, and he's like, I want to be an actor. And I said, well, unless you are an actor and you are 110% don't do it because it's tough. Again, I've had a long, beautiful resume, but it's still hard. Even to this day, I have a movie coming out next year, but also I haven't worked in almost a year. So it's like, 
you have to be able to sustain yourself somehow through this business. And, you know, uh, it's tough. So, yeah, you have to, you have to be obsessive to a, a, a healthy degree, you know. Um, you don't want to be unhealthy, which is the other way around, and, and tearing yourself down because as actors, I think we are our own worst enemy. You know, it's much easier to uh, be loving and, and, and inviting to somebody else, but how are you to, towards yourself? And as actors, man, all of our, our emotions are on, on the level, on the skin level right here. They're always accessible. So, you know, it, it's a daily, I, I think, um, thing to remind yourself that you gotta love yourself and you gotta push yourself in this business and uh, don't become complacent. But I constantly relapse and think to myself, why am I doing this? Because acting is a very abusive relationship. You really have to know what it is. And I'm also not one of those people. I'm one of the rare few who don't believe that to be an actor, it's like all you need to focus on. I actually think to be an actor, you have to have other sources of happiness, other sources of fulfillment. And honestly, I think even other sources of work. And then you can really give yourself to acting because what makes acting really hard is when it, when it gets confused with the career. Because once you're relying on acting for money, all of a sudden the desperation works its way into the audition room. And that, you know, some people never figure out how to do that. It's a very difficult um, career path to really pursue and to also do it in a way where you're actually able to enjoy the acting and not be completely reliant on the ends, whether you succeed or not. Uh, in order to be happy because we know that even you know I work a ton and even then it's so often a struggle lots of ups and downs so I have to remember what it is and what it means to me and for me at this point in my life I have a wife I have a kid I have other sources of fulfillment and I also have other sources of income because that's the only way that I can be happy with acting because you, you know throughout your career you're like you have hundreds of thousands of doubts <laughs> even while working you know, I, I spoke to Jack Lemmon on a film that I was doing, that he was doing, that I happened to be working with him. That's what really happened. <laughs> and then um, and I, I asked him, I said, I asked him about the, you know, I mean, he's a legend. I knew that then when I was in my 20s working with him. And I asked him about how he dealt with uh, the challenges back in his day. You know, his grandpa was a contract player, so he had work every week, whether he worked or not, he was getting paid. And he was like, oh my God, he was glitching. He was like, I thought, Every gig was my last gig. You know, it's Jack Lemon. I was like, you thought every gig, so I'm okay. I'm okay when I get really scared or I think I'm not gonna make it or you know, I got my bills paid for the most part. You know, I'm good. You know, I don't live in a mansion, but I don't want a mansion. I don't need a mansion, you know, to be happy. I was not good in school. I tried like hell, but I was not good. I was very dyslexic without knowing it. I think a lot of actors are. And uh, it was a great education for me. You know, it was a great way to learn about something and especially to express it in a certain way. It made it really stick, whatever it was that I was studying. My story about myself is, um, goes up in conflict with sort of a public persona, you know, almost all the time. Um, you know, I. I, I am a public personality, and um, oftentimes I don't think that what's projected out there is me. But um, I've come to accept that as you know somebody that sort of lives half of his life in public. I know that I can't control that version of myself, that story that is being told by a big collective or through you know a lot of different outlets. Um, it certainly contrasts with who I, I think I am, but I also um, have kind of reconciled myself with it, that it's just part of my life. For me, the more is um, dramatic, the more you, you, has, you, has, you have to, to use humor to, uh, to, to move on. And um, I grew up like that. I started as a comedian because you, humor for me is um, a wonderful weapon. And humor is the, the 
the shortest way uh, between two people. When you want to connect with someone, humor is the fast way to connect. So um, I, I, I use humor all the time. It's part of my personality. And the, it's the same for Eric and Olivier, the directors. That's why we, 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 we love working and being together because we, we, we have that communication with humor. And, um, and I think when you talk about the subject like uh, immigration or the burnout, it's um, easier to talk about it with a little bit of humor. And they used to say it's the, um, the um, champagne bubbles. <laughs> I would say stay in school, stay diligent, uh, go through high school, go through college, and try to look through opportunities after having sort of learned all you can learn and situate yourself and be comfortable before you get into acting. Know that you're doing, there's something else that you could be doing. Know that you have a backup plan because it's a very difficult, tough game to get into. And, and it's tough to maintain even once you're in. So it's not like once, just because you book something means you're gonna be working forever. So you have to always keep that hustle up and continue to look for new avenues. And know that if this doesn't work, I got something else in the back. If that don't work, I got something else. Have uh, other alternatives as well. And don't focus all your energy on acting would be um, my thing. Boxers are, you know, um, they're, they sacrifice, dedication, discipline. You know, I find that I have that in my own life with my own career. You know, it takes a fighter's mentality to, you know, to work in this business. And uh, we share that. If you really want to be great at something, you know, maybe you can't be the best friend or the best brother or the best son or the best, you know, whatever. Like, it's... Uh, you know, that quest for greatness, it is. It's going to be a selfish journey. But if you, look, you only get one chance at this life. So if you really want to give everything to something, then it's going to be, um, yeah, it is going to be an isolated journey. And you just have to be comfortable with, you know, other areas of your, of your life being sacrificed for that. You know, I have a good family. I have great friends that I've known since I was like 14, 15. I don't have to worry about, oh, is this guy going to screw me over or whatever? It's like, no, nah, I've, I've known these guys more than half my life. Uh... You know, I've got a great professional team of people around me. I've got a good girl. Like, it's all, um, I don't know. I got enough things to kind of still make me feel like myself. It's I the think there's animal. plenty of narcissism in any field to go around, but uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm not slamming actors because, but we are self-employed. It is, you are the the product, so you have to, take care of yourself, make sure you're taken care of. And, and so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit different. Of course there's narcissism in music. If you're lucky enough to, I'm very humble in music because I am not a rock star at the moment, but when uh, you get, uh, it's the old adage, um, you can tell who somebody is, not when they're at the bottom, but when they're on the top and they have the, the free will to do to actually act and that's when you're at the top you see how somebody treats people that's who they are and lynn jones <laughs> evidently didn't didn't treat people very well because <laughs> he's got to make amends while he's eating red vines i don't think many people need, feel the need to compete with me <laughs> i think Stop. i'm chasing um no i haven't had that experience before i don't think I've, i haven't either i it's and perhaps maybe just it's been there and maybe someone hasn't said it um of course it's a competitive industry and and we're all vying for you know the same roles and the great jobs but i've been fortunate enough to work with some great people particularly mandy who was wonderful and there was no, there is not a competitive great. bone in her body she's so supportive and kind and just such a great teammate so yeah i haven't you know really had that experience in hmm. in the work world i haven't either I think I've been, I've really lucked out that I haven't encountered anybody in that regard. It's you know felt the need to be competitive. I yeah. feel like the the industry pits us all against one another as women uh -huh. anyway. And there's just there's enough there's enough room for everybody. True. And just having faith that like things work out the way they're supposed to and we should be there to support and build each other up. You know? Absolutely. Thank it's you. a competitive world too that we yeah. live in nowadays. I mean, with social media and everyone sort of looking at like someone's seemingly perfect life and the way they're sort of curating things, it's, it's not necessarily re real either. And I think that's exactly. what you have to remember and just stay in your own lane and do the work and hopefully good things come. Your focus should be your work. 
just do your work and whatever happens from that and find any way to do it like this idea that everybody's going to come and be famous is like ridiculous it's are you gonna are you doing the work because you love the work and you want to give something then great then enjoy the hell out of it and if you get to get a ride like i've had then great enjoy it but um it's not about an end result honestly i think there's a, a danger in saying a, a first success because I, I think life's just a series of successes and failures so even in this business you know, success to me is, is doing the job that I got to do in that room. You know, whether I get the role or not, but I, the fact that I, I'm able to pull off a performance and give a performance, because I like to give a performance when I audition, instead of auditioning, you know, I kind of like to do a lot of the prep work prior, like some of the heavier prep work that most actors might reserve for after they get the gig. If I have the time, I'll, I'll delve deeply into it. Just, that's part of the fun. You know, and if, if you want to do a good job, but in regards to making a living, um, gosh, you know, you're, you're, it's the struggle. You're juggling jobs. You're juggling regular jobs that let you go to auditions on top of auditioning. You know, so it's like there's a struggle in that, and there's a success in that as well. So being a self-starter and 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 not you know trying to create your own opportunities is really important I mean that's that's probably the single biggest piece of advice I give young actors you know there's so many mediums available now with social networking and uh, you know with the internet to create your own uh, media business card and you know go out and produce something with your friends you know put it on YouTube do something that's gonna show you that you can then send out and at least say hey take a look at me you know, a lot of that wasn't available to me when I started out in kind of the, you know, the, the late 80s. Um, so I, I think to answer your question, to come full circle, yeah, it's important to study, but you don't want to be a lifelong student without jumping into the pool and actually getting into the, uh, you know, the professional aspect. I mean, it's called show business. Um, there's, you know, there's a thing that we used to always say is that there's, there's probably a lot of waiters out there that are maybe more accomplished, better actors in class than I am. But you know, you got to get out there and, and take a swing to get in the business. Yeah, I was all in when I started. You know, I don't, I can't half step, I can't, I can't just put a little bit in because then I won't get the results. But then I also don't put anything into um, things that I'm not passionate about or curious about. You know, I know from the start if I'm just in it for other reasons. And this was something that I said from the start, I'm going all in. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start training. I'm going to figure out how people are able to transform in the way that they do on screen. And I'm going to do that. You know, I just, I, you know, it was something that I just felt that I could go after. And there was nothing that was going to stop it. And for the first several years I was writing, I was deep in my acting career. And writing was more therapeutic to get my mind off of uh, the very painful <laughs> trials and tribulations of an acting career because um, it's very difficult and you get rejected a lot and uh, all the cliches are absolutely true. And then, um, but I was serious about it, but it was, uh, you know, I think it just took a while of realizing the, the beating yourself up and the I have no talent or this is terrible or I, I'll, I'll work with a writer um, and they'll say, oh, that was shit. And I said, don't, don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it if it's good or bad. Just let's just we'll take a look at it and see what what could be improved. You know, there's no reason to be so caustic and hostile about the material. It's just words on a screen. You can change them. <laughs> it's, it's just just change them. Um, so that's very much uh, something that guides me in in my work. When I was. Uh... It's not that I'm not serious now, but I was so serious when I first uh, started, which is a good thing, but um, there were certain things that I passed on because in my young mind, it wasn't serious enough. And it was a, it was a huge mistake because there was a great experience there to be had. It isn't, isn't always about the quintessential part or anything like that. So in, in that way, I wish that I had uh, 
taken it just slightly less seriously. I don't think I'm the fastest learner, um, but I always say that if I get something, I have a chance to, to do it well. Um, that's, that was my football career and switching positions and the things that I went through. Um, I didn't pick things up um, very quickly, but I was able to get it eventually and then succeed at it. And so I've understood patience for a long time because I've just, I've known that about myself. So uh, when I finished playing, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't put a, a time limit like this has to happen in a year or this has to happen in three years. I just said, I'm just going to be patient and, and train and learn and, and see what can come from it. And so I was just blessed to have an opportunity come a couple of years later where I could put some of the training to work. It's um, demoralizing. It's demoralizing. It's hard to keep up your enthusiasm and uh, your joie de vivre about what you're doing. Uh, when you're only getting into the rooms maybe once every one or two or three months. Um, and I don't know if there's a way around that other than to not let that define who you are as a person. I mean, if you're not auditioning and, you, and, and your reaction to that is to just stay at home and turn on old TV shows and you know, cry about not auditioning. You know, I don't think that really serves to help the situation at all. Um, and and I used to do that. Of course, everybody. Th you you're an actor. You want to be acting. You want to be given the opportunity to act. And if you're not getting those things, it's depressing and discouraging. Instead, though. I mean, and I still go through those periods where there are, you know, feast and famine times. Um, and when things aren't as, as fast as they have been in the past, you know, I just, I go out and do something I enjoy. I find um, some other thing to occupy my mind. Uh, one of the best things to do is to go help somebody else. Because when I'm thinking about somebody else and helping them, what am I not thinking about myself and my own problems? So I really strongly recommend that in addition to you know, whatever interests outside of acting that you have, throw in some sort of volunteer work. I, 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 I can't tell you how much that's benefited me and, and gotten my gotten me out of my own head sometimes, which is the worst place to be sometimes. Just the worst. Um, and those times will pass. They always have. They always will. Of course, you always think with every job that it's the last job you'll ever have. You'll never work again. And uh, the truth is I've been doing this a long time and I have been provided for by the universe through all of it. And there's no reason to think that that won't continue to happen for as long as it's supposed to happen. So I'm content with that and if things are a little slow, I'll just go off and do something else that I enjoy. Like I said, it's, there's all this time, that time in between which is tough. Was it um, Michael Caine said, you know, they pay me to wait. Acting I do for free, right? So there you go. It's a lot of waiting around. So you just, just got to stay at it and work out and stay healthy and focus on your craft and go for it when you get a shot, you know. People always say how difficult psychologically it is for actors during the times that they're not working. And I don't think until you've been an actor and experienced that, you really understand the depths of how difficult those times can be. I think you have to go through that so that you start strategizing how to not emotionally go through that the next time that you have a downtime. You know, how to be happy during those periods when, you know, you're not the guy being called for, for the, the part in the film or on a TV series. And I, I think that it's, you know, the steel is tempered in the fire sort of deal. If you can, if you can make it through those tough times and come out um, intact and maybe even a little bit better, it makes you that much more interesting a person and therefore hopefully an actor. It's all in your inner attitude. You know, you say you don't want to do it. Well, that's, 
that's being kind of simplistic about life because you can always find some good in any experience, even a bad experience. Something you think is bad could be a good experience. You don't even know that until years later, perhaps, or weeks later, or days later. You know, sometimes the bad things in life where you're being tried is, is the things that make you grow. So, I mean, I look at it that way. So, say if I do a couple of movies, I always try to find some good in each of those roles, even if perhaps if I was sitting on a pile of money, I didn't have to take that job. Maybe I would have waited around for something better but, you know, what you think is better, <clears throat> a lot of actors can sit around and wait for a long time and nothing happens. But a lot of times you can do something and, and out of that energy comes something that you can't even imagine, you know. That's just how life is. So, so I, just, I just take any role and I just try to make the best of it and try to enjoy it. That's how I look at it. And this wasn't one of those pictures. This was one of something I wanted to do. But I do s stuff... You know, that sometimes I'm not 100% sure about, but you know what? Most of the time afterwards, I, I'm glad I did it. I always think that because something good will always happen, you know? There's no uh, real red flags beyond some, the, the, the quality, or the, perceived, the, the quality I perceive something to have, you know, be it uh, religiously inclined or however you say that. I don't know that that would stop me from doing something if I thought it read well enough and if it was uh, decent, you know? Uh, but, yeah, I'm pretty easy in that sense, you know, being a working actor in Los Angeles, I've got to pay my rent. So, honestly, if it comes through and it's not the worst thing I've ever seen, I'll probably entertain the idea of doing it. Because you always meet interesting people on set and you always learn something, even if the character you're playing is, is empty and shallow and, and you can't identify with it at all. You'll have an experience on set that'll be worthwhile. Or just, you'll be working with someone new or you'll make a friend. So there's so many facets to it that I, I, I feel like I'm not at really at a position to be super picky with stuff. You know, I'm not being offered things left and right in crazy huge productions. I still go to auditions every, every time I need to book something. Uh, so, you know, I take what, come, what comes around and if it's good, then great. And if it's not, then, you know, something, something will happen anyway. Uh, every, every job's a new opportunity, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you have to be willing I mean, you can't get so into like, oh, I've got to keep a... You've got to be willing to take a shot on something and fall on your face, too. Um, but every single thing is a, is a new experience. It's a chance to learn about something else, a chance to work with some new great people. Um, so, I don't know, the older I get, uh, the, I don't, the less competitive I feel about it. You know, it's just, uh, I feel like I'm lucky to be here. and It's, uh, it's more of a collaborative uh, thing, you know. It's life that matters, not only what you do on film or on television, because it's your personal growth. Ultimately, that's why we we're all here. And you can still have great, do great work, but you know, it wasn't such a great life, maybe, for you or for your children or for your family or friends. So you have to kind of stay close to yourself and your personal growth while you're trying to get this other stuff done in the business. And that's kind of, that balance is quite hard to hit. And that's, I think, where, you know, I, I, I work on that every day, and I think a lot of, you know, I think that's one of my strengths, perhaps, that I've stayed kind of close to, to who I am, who I was, before I got in here in this crazy town, you know. And I think that is what people have to remember. Because that, that's the big thing that will derail you. Failure or success can screw you up, you know. It's the middle way, like Buddha says, the middle way. That's where you should be most of the time. And that's, that's the healthiest way of existing, I think. Because the big stuff is great, but it always goes away and it can lead to a lot of negatives. And the really lows, too, are tough as well. So, you know, you're trying to stay in the middle ground. I had a moment where I just had a series of adults and children all ask me if I was an actor or if I was... I reminded them of this actor or this character, all within like... like I, it seems like a six, six to eight week span. I'd have people with me, it'd be happening. It was happening like just so frequently. It was just really like, all right, maybe I should listen to the voices of these people that I don't know and become an actor. And I asked my grandfather, my mom wasn't into it. There's no way now, you're not gonna make it. I mean, she actually laughed at me, um, which sucks as a kid. You know, you turn to your parents as mentors and teachers and this and that, but that's a whole nother story. Grandpa said yes, so I'm grateful for that when he said you can do it that's all I needed to hear is from somebody I cared about that I knew cared about me telling me something like that 
Uh, it's different because of the type of movies, um, like uh, X Men or Jurassic World. This kind of type of movie I can I can't do in France. Like uh, to to uh, to have a character uh, kind of superhero, I can't do that in France. That's that's the type of that's the type of genre I can't do in France. And um, also the directors I work with in US, uh, they they're not they are not working in France. So that's that's the difference. And uh, for me as an actor, I learned a lot with Eric and Olivier that they are the first director making me uh, uh, acting. So I have um, my way to, to, to connect with, with, in a project is the director. So, um, so I love um, meeting directors. So the, the directors I met here was, was, good, was a good experience for me, make me grow as an actor. So um, I hope it will be continue. I suppose if I were to advise my younger self, I would have said don't start so early. Really? Yeah. Even though I got really lucky, like the, the only reason that I'm still in the industry is because it came over the right time when I did the right audition and I, and I booked it and Rob Reiner was very kind to cast me. Uh, I would say become a better person or a better human, you know, a more evolved version of yourself before you come and start doing interviews and talking to people and, uh, and, and I suppose, uh, uh, in making yourself known, uh, I would have liked to have started now because I'm now I'm quite comfortable with who I am, and I think part of who I am is born of this industry now, having been here for six years and done so much traveling while I've been here. Uh, it, 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 I might not be who I am now uh, should I have not come early, but as I am now, I'd say to myself, don't come early, go finish school, you know, because I wanted to be, I, I wanted to be either a physicist or a cetologist, like a, you know, a marine biologist and someone who studies whales, I would have loved to have done that. Even if I could just swim with a whale, I would have been content and then come and been an actor in, uh, in America. I don't know, yeah, I feel like, uh, I feel like I was still too much a kid. I didn't really know who I was or what I was doing, and I wish I'd never spoken to anyone out here while I was that young. Well, a of course, I, I couldn't have gotten into the business if I didn't uh, uh, know any anybody or just, um, and um, just having this this interest in in acting, um, and if and if you don't want to act, you don't you don't necessarily have to, um, and but it's something that you do if if you truly want to do it. So um, you know if 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 you're interested by acting and if you're interested in in being somebody else then you should definitely pursue and you also want to direct one day um i would like to direct one day um yeah that's why i'm i'm so happy that i was able to work with bob and, and everybody else Did the two of you direct each other at any point wouldn't dream of it <laughs> wouldn't dream of it great thank you <laughs>
is, and that's part of the conversation you have with the audience and how they respond to things, particularly autobiographical things. So you become very aware of who you are and how you come across. But uh, I don't know. I think of uh, acting and stand-up as very different uh, disciplines, but I also... I love acting because it's, in some ways, it's the opposite of stand-up, whereas stand-up, I'm writer, director, producer, uh, and every beat and moment of the show is controlled and influenced by me. I love the opportunity to be this uh, spoke in this larger, uh, uh, just even a moment in a scene, serving a narrative of a story is is really exciting. And also it's fun to to kind of hide in a different character and have a different uh, a different point of view. I mean, I think in my stand-up, I, I kind of engage different points of views, but in acting, it's really fun to um, kind of climb behind a different point of view and see how they would adjust. Of course, it's still you, but, um, you know, like playing Paul Markham, you know, he's a lawyer, so that's, I think, that, that influenced how he viewed everything. He was also um, someone who really liked Ted. So I think those elements really had an influence, whereas in stand-up, there's uh, a greater likelihood of taking the irreverent point of view. It's definitely fun to put yourself in other people's shoes, you know, just to kind of be a little apathetic to, like, what you would do or what another person would do, how another person would act. Um, I do live life and work separately, so that's why I kind of don't feel like I'm living someone else's life because I really do live my life to the fullest. And then I have an amazing job that gets me to, like, you know, tap into other people's lives. <laughs> I'd like to be challenged. I like to ch be challenged and do things that I haven't done before. So that's when I get to learn a new skill set, um, when I get to uh, jump into another culture, another lifestyle. You know, um, there's only a handful of roles that I, I really won't play, like pedophiles. I, I just can't. I can't. I can't. The, the research on that is, is taxing on the soul. I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm very anti that. <laughs> you know? Characters are realizations from people's imaginations. So naturally, uh, some are going to fit with your imagination, and some aren't. And some are based off of real people and are accurate depictions, and some aren't. So you have to use discernment and figure out what speaks to you, what's real to you, and everything's not going to be. I think when you first start acting, you're going to take anything that comes at you because you're trying to work it. That's understandable. That's what I did. That's what I think most actors did when they first started out because you need to work. It is a job. But at the same time, once you start to develop your craft and you can sort of weed out um, what speaks to you and what's important because it's also important to do things that uh, correlate with your frequency, that go with how you're attempting to move because if it doesn't, you're portraying something that isn't genuine. And then your performance is good. People are going to see it and be like, there's something that isn't genuine about that. So just make sure it connects to you. This is why it's important, I think, to expand your horizons and awareness so that way more things have the uh, ability to um, sort of click with you. Because the, 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 broad, the more broad your horizon is, the more chance you'll be like, oh yeah, I know what that is. Rather than living in a sort of vacuum and then something coming into your awareness, you're like, that's, uh, that's too foreign, I don't know what that is, you know. And never judge the characters. I. It's an interesting thing when you're when you're playing a character when I'm when I'm playing a character because I'm basically going through a process where I'm not looking to um, be reductive at all or to judge uh, the person. Uh, I, I could I could from a different point of view talk about Bobby and talk about some of the things he said and and say they were awful and destructive and I. I, I do believe that, but in terms of kind of where my sympathy lies, I, I have to go dig into this without judgment and just try to understand, right? I, I look at behavior and I'm really just trying to understand behavior, not judge the behavior. Um, so I, I find Bobby Fischer fascinating and I have my kind of... Um, I guess assessments as as I apply them to how I'm 
portraying him. One of my great acting teachers, when I was a very young actor, when I asked a similar question, he said, I'm going to make it real simple for you. He said, it's like falling into darkness backward. Imagine just falling into darkness backward. No control of your landing, if you're going to be caught or not. Just fall. Everybody said, well, well suppose there's a rock back there, or suppose there's a, um, I don't know, no pillows and just hard floor. The writer is saying to you, I want you to fall into darkness backward. I've given you all the description, the director and I, of who the character is. We've had rehearsals and discussions about who this human being is. I do not want you to describe them to me. I want you to become them by falling into darkness backward. Can you do that? I mean, that's kind of like a weird thing. It's, it's something that you try not to be conscious of. You know, I try not to be conscious too much of my body movements. You know, it's kind of maybe something that just, you hope just happens naturally. And, and you know, if you're, I guess if you're focused on, if you're focused on the, the important the task at hand, yeah. right? Well, right. if you're right, the if result. you're focused on the result, that's the bad thing. If you're focused at the real task at hand, then that's that's the good thing. And so, and if if you believe, if you're trying your hardest to believe in this fake scenario, which is what it is, then hopefully, um, if you trick your mind well enough, maybe hopefully that comes across, your and, your, follow, and your body yeah. will follow. Yeah. I also think that certainly we convey emotion through our eyes in every way, including crying. But I think maybe more important even is I think we convey intelligence through our eyes. Do you know what I mean? When I, when I watch someone understand something, I see it a little bit in their body language, but I mostly see it in their eyes. Or when I see someone worried about something or trying to figure something out, like it's, the eyes are the, where you see the most reaction, do you know? So, I, 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 I one of the most important things, I think, on film that's very different from on stage is, as human beings, we're thinking all the time. We're calculating and we're, you know, uh, maneuvering and planning. And I think that we see that somewhat in our body language, but mostly in, in our eyes. We see, we see the other person think. And so when you see an actor really thinking on screen, you believe they're a real person. Watching stuff from, I mean, I've been acting for four and a half years now, watching some of my first stuff. I remember thinking at the time, because especially in movies, you shoot it and then you don't get to see it until a, like a year more later, yeah. you know? And you've grown and changed so much in that time. So watching it, you're like, sometimes you'll be like, oh, why did I, why did I convey that emotion? Or why did I make that face? And you're looking at it, but you're nitpicking things. And it's, at the time, I believe I did the best I could, you know? And it's just, I think it's just slight unconscious things of just learning to try and, you know, put all the emotions there and have stuff be on the eyes and really know that there's a process going on. Yeah. I find that, like, most of the learning happens in the process of making the film and that I can't, I usually watch a film or anything that I've made, like, maybe one time and then sort of put it away. I think the, the general thing as an actor, as a young actor, is, like, you want to lean into those emotions, the big emotions in a in a project, in the arc of a character, and I think that's something I've learned over the years is maybe to avoid leaning into those emotions too much. I don't need anything. I can go, I can cry, I can laugh, I can get angry. I am like a sieve. It just goes in and out of me and it's all fun. I like feelings. I like to have a lot of feelings. I love to cry. I love to get angry. I love to be scared. I love to do all the feelings, joy, I'm trying to think if there's any feeling that I don't like playing. The hardest feeling to play wow, is no feeling.
to be repressed, to be dull, to be boring is the hardest thing to play because there's a lot of feeling that goes into no feeling. There's a lot of feeling that goes into repression. A lot of feelings. Well, you have all the feelings, but you don't show them. You don't express them. They're all there. And you rise above them, or you don't show them. Actually, it's a very interesting thing to play. It was quite you know, a, a dry piece of footage. She's interviewing someone, so the subject takes up most of the air. Um, and it's about a zoning board petition in Sarasota. It's not the most mm. thrilling bit of material, but it was, it, you know, in the in the 70s, often they'd shoot things in one static wide shot. So I, could, I was able to watch her all the way through and watch her responses and her body language and her, and it, you know, you can, it, it sounds like a short amount of stuff to to go on, but actually you can intuit an awful lot about someone from first meeting, as we know, and, if, and, it, and often those intuitions are quite powerful. So if sort of the building of the character felt like an exercise in letting that intuition work on this bit of footage and building it from there. Everything I get my hands on. One of the best things I got my hands on was some old sailing footage of Ted and Joe sailing the Wairo, the boats, you know, that they sailed on Chappaquiddick. You know, just seeing them that day on the phone, Ted on the phone, in the gear, young dudes looking, you know, Ray-Bans. Joe was smoking a cigarette, blew a sail on the boat. You know, just, you're looking for something that captures, you know, them when they, they got the, you're looking for both, the public one, the unguarded ones, the little moments, the mannerisms, you know, the funeral, there's so much on these guys, the whole family. I, you know, I watched a lot of and read a lot of the, the other brothers, not just Ted, I didn't just, I didn't just go for Ted, I went for the others, I went for the family, you know, I went for, watch, you know, pictures in that of Joe, you know, how to behave around your father. Um, you know, there's, there's there's so much there, and in particular the speeches, some of the some of the most some of the some of the greatest speeches ever said and written, particularly by Bobby. I just try to read it once a day from the first to the last page. Um, and there's no really there's no real strategy, or I don't have a. There's just more by reading it once a day. I I feel like I things happen, and I come up with thoughts and ideas and. And I'll discover something, even if it's the 55th time I read the script, there's something I'll, I'll discover something or come up with an, an idea for the character or an idea for a specific scene, or it could be something more general. Um, and then a lot of those ideas are terrible. Uh, but by doing that, at least like it's start, something starts a, a kind of a, a, uh, an internal creative process where, um, and then it's more about filter out those 99% of bad ideas and then holding on to those ones that you think are actually good for the, the foundation of the character in a way. Um, so yeah, it's just the way I prepare it, I guess. I work all the time on, uh, on backstory, all the time, so I know what it is I'm talking about. Because a line can mean uh, uh, many different things. Uh, and I need to know specifically what I mean by what I say. All my characters, no matter how small the part is, is I'm just trying to get in the headspace of that character's point of view. And so I'm constantly trying to, and I basically, when I write, I act out the parts in my head as I'm writing them. And I used to think I was crazy. And then uh, I read an interview with Aaron Sorkin where he said he played all the parts as he read, as he wrote them in his head, and I thought, oh, I do too. <laughs> you know, I was this, with this relief that, okay, well, the great screenwriter of our times is what he does, so, uh, and that had been my process. So that's where I'm constantly just trying to get into the voice and the headspace of the characters as I write them. When I take on a role, um, I'm going to do whatever research I possibly can, you know, in terms of Fort Bliss, it was really important to me. I mean, these are, these are real people that we're portraying, and if you're not going to do it the right way, then I'm if I'm not going to do it, you know. And I don't think anybody else should do it unless they're going to do whatever, whether they're playing um, a truck driver, a doctor, a, a, you know, a soldier, whatever it is. So that's a, that's a very high standard for myself, and 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 doing that and having that approach gives me confidence. Um, so that's um, first and foremost. It's just it's just doing the research and doing the work. I did quite a bit. I, I watched and listened to anything I could get my hands on um, and 
kept doing that, you know, for a long time. Uh, firstly, to learn about him in the beginning as we were setting out to figure out what the movie was, I, um, you know, read a bunch uh, and watched as much as I could find. And then, and then later as we had, we were going towards making the movie, then I would just, I would just listen to him constantly or, you know, watch interviews every day. I went to a local trainer here, one of the greatest trainers in the world, Freddie Roach, and um, I went through um, Manny Pacquiao and uh, versus Bradley, their training camp, and Freddie taught me everything he knows about about being a trainer, whispering in the ear, doing the mitts, you know, giving them water, the chess game that you play. Um, so I got a pretty good, good education, and then I found, unfortunately, Kevin Rooney is in the hospital with dementia, and so I wasn't able to work with him. Uh, but I worked with his son, and I learned as much as I could about him and, uh, and put it on screen. When I go in for the audition, I usually haven't read the script, uh, just because, I don't know, it's probably like an ego thing. I'm always like, oh, you know, they probably won't cast me anyway, so why should I read their script? But honestly, it's just because I'm kind of lazy. Uh, but these days, I've gotten better at it. I, I will read the script before I go in. Uh, but. Certainly, when I'm when I'm casting something, I'll read it through a couple of times beforehand. But uh, I like to. I also like to discuss it with the other actors a little bit and see what their take of it is. But yeah, I don't I don't read it too many times because I don't want it to be stale for me. You know, it's like if ever you've I don't know if you've ever tried to write anything. I've always I've been trying to write things my whole life, but I usually leave it too long. And so I've read through the thing so many times, and I've read it so many times that I lose interest in it myself. So for for a script, I you know five times, maybe five or six times bef until rap. Any more than that, and I think I'll get bored of it. We still had a couple of days before we started shooting, and, you know, like during the wardrobe fittings and all that, you're still discussing the characters, you're discussing things, and, um, I mean, I spent time looking at the script beforehand, but you can only do so much prep work, you know, especially on such an improv-based movie. Like, I mm -hmm. kn we knew the general motion, so it was about 20 minutes before each scene where Hannah would come to us, and we'd be like, okay, so this is kind of what we need to information we need to get across in the scene and here's like a line or two in case you can't think of anything and then she kind of just let us loose yeah i think yeah it's totally project dependent like um certain characters demand a certain type of preparation if you're going to change your physicality or your voice or something like that and other and sometimes you have a lot of time to prepare and sometimes you just don't sometimes you only have a week or something so um yeah it just depends because I've had both experiences. I, I really, I mean, uh, most of the projects that I've worked on uh, uh, are scripted. And uh, one, uh, uh, if the script is well written and well uh, and ready, then uh, it doesn't need you to be improvising. And most of the directors that I worked with, whether it's Wolfgang Peterson or, or Sidney Pollack, uh, uh, they, they, they don't want you improvising. They, they, the, the script is, is crafted in a certain kind of way and that's the way they want it, but this is a different situation. Uh, so um, sometimes it's marvelous and sometimes it seems really uh, chaotic. So I have both feelings about it. Everybody's got their uh, particular route, but the thing I think is important to be an actor is always keep an open mind, always be willing to learn. And don't reach a point where you feel like I've learned enough and now I don't need to know anything else because, you know, your talent will take you so far. But you need to be constantly trying to develop skills and learning how to access these characters and analyze these stories and tell them in the most uh, authentic light. And while your talent will take you a long way, it won't take you to the heights that you want to go because there's a cap, a moment where you're like, well, this is, this is just my talent. So you need to constantly uh, stretch yourself, travel, meet new people, engage in new experiences fearlessly, and sort of download that information into sort of creating what you want to create. Every role is different. So what may work for one role may not work for another, and vice versa. Sometimes your talent will be great for a certain role, and then for another role you have to reach outside the um, uh, sort of boundaries of your uh, natural talent in order to tap into it. Those are things that I find the most rewarding and the most difficult. And they cause me to have to get studious and learn all these things, you know, and get into these different mm, lifestyles and understanding. So always keep an open mind, and I think you can explore and do whatever you need to do. And realize, remember, this game is not a competition. It seems like a competition, but it's not. The only person you're in competition with is yourself. And if you think you can't do a certain thing, you can't. If you think you can, you can. 
you just gotta push yourself. As true as we think we're being to ourselves, we can always be a little truer. You know, seeking a, a depth of authenticity, if you will. You know, like like I, I'm just I've just on this crazy journey lately through through my work and the demands of trying to do better work um, has, has pushed me to to lose sleep and study harder and faster and and just go longer and it's um it's just interesting because if you pay attention to the signs in those moments and do what's right and what speaks to your integrity I can always rest well with whatever happens you know I'm not feeling bad I'm feeling good about the decisions I make and that's a good feeling do what you love and do what inspires you when you see it that makes you feel something or make makes you want to do that thing but also listen to people's criticism. Mm -hmm. Like I, I feel like the one mistake I feel like I, I see comedians make, because comedians tend to be, myself included, stubborn people, but um, is when comedians or any other artists are just kind of like, no, it's my way, and and I, I and just and they don't want to take criticism. You have to take criticism from people you trust. You know, Ira and I, I feel like thrive on that in terms of. He's really critical, and it it, ha right. we it, both it, it helps. We surround ourselves with people who critique our work, and and we change our work, and uh, it's a constant process of of trying to make the work better. There are some actors. I won't mention their names, but they're they are so involved in the legitimacy of what they do. They're there before the crew and me. They just sit on the set and sit in the seat they know they're going to be in sometimes, or if, they're, if it's supposed to be their bedroom, they'll go around the bedroom and touch the props and do what is never become familiar with the pictures on the wall and what's in the closet, what kind of bed sheets are they, what color is the bed, and how soft are the pillows, and why are those pillows that soft, or why are they harder, or... Is the blind closed or is it open? And uh, is there curtains on the wall? Uh, and why was that color chosen for the sheet? And ah, okay. And they're comfortable because it's their bedroom for the last 15 years. So sometimes they come to the set two days before and they just sit there and they become organically ingrained. Um, some of the great actors have their own ways of becoming the truth of what they're supposed to be. And I get there and they're there. Hey, Bill, how you doing, man? What you doing here, man? You know what I'm doing, I'm working. I see you and thank you because I, I respect that. They don't just wait for you to tell them what to do. They have their own, because I'm an actor too. As you start surrendering to a character that the author has written, it's, it's going to sound crazy, but the character tries to live through you if you accept him or her. I was playing a character once in a movie, I forgot which one it was, and a week before I was supposed to film, I started doing this. Never done that in my life. My girlfriend at the time said, what are you doing? I said, wait, she said, you're going I said, no, I'm not. She says, okay, watch. Five minutes later, I'm going <laughs> That was the character coming through me. And so I put that in part of the film. Because I knew something that was being expressed through that person. And it's trust. Trusting your instincts yourself and your talent. I was on, the, on an airplane once with Al Pacino. I did a film called Sea of Love with him. And we were flying to Toronto to rehearse. And he was talking about John Gilgood in a film. And he said, he's gotten free. And it, I didn't know what that meant. But I knew Pacino knew what it meant. And moreover, the way he said it, there was a sense of reverence about the notion that an actor had gotten free. Now, John Gilbert's been doing this for a long time, and so had Al Pacino. 
So the, the, the thing was, he was saying about his performance, he's gotten free. Well, I saw that on McConaughey. He was free. Any impulse, any thought, any movement, any moment, it was, it was like, whew, he was free to do whatever came to him in that instant. Whatever he was playing off of, whatever preparation he had, he was utterly free with it. And I thought, we're into something special here. We're into something really special here. You know, to find your way into somebody else's mind is, uh, is a process. And the more you learn about how they lived, who they were, how they express themselves in a number of different situations can, you know, trying to put yourself into their shoes can often lead you to what they were thinking under those circumstances. Uh, and that I, I find to be captivating if you can actually get into it, you know. It's a fragile business. I find that often it's like splitting atoms in some ways because we all have our own things going on in our heads and to try to submerge yourself into something else is a, is a wonderful challenge. Uh, not often is one successful in actually producing a, a complete uh, performance or a complete character, uh, but it's it's really fun to try. I pride myself in being, at least trying to be a professional, right? And I know you do the same. I try. Uh, yes, and you're incredible at it. But it's also uh, it's a it's good to have a combination of being professional, but also having a lot of fun on mm. set and not taking it too seriously where you can't enjoy yourself when you're not actually rolling. Yeah. And so just creating a, a beautiful um, environment for the, the cast and crew yeah. to, to And to a safe in. place to kind of experiment and test yourself. And mm -hmm. that, that is, going back to what Aaron said, you know, making sure that the, when we come off stage, uh, stage, stage, well, she's an actor, yeah. she's a stage yeah. actress in her head, um, <laughs> set that you are, supported and and you have a, a good bunch of people around you that mm -hmm. you you know honor you and you want to honor them in return so um yeah it was very much that on this project but i do think you're always looking for something to learn yeah and take with you it's great when you don't have to be conscious of blocking that was great so in hannah's maybe we didn't have to be aware of it too much um i mean hannah would be like okay the camera's probably be in this general area but she still let us move and the camera would move with us exactly um, it's all about following what we were yeah. doing with this film, which is great. Mm -hmm. I like to really think about that stuff when we're rehearsing, mm -hmm. because that's when you sort of, with this film is less locked in, but when you do the rehearsal, which is right before you shoot it, uh, that's when you start to lock yourself into things. So mm -hmm. I really think about it a lot then, and then I try to totally forget about it. Yeah. I mean, it, sometimes it's hard. I remember there was a, I was shooting season one of American Horror Story, and on the pilot there was this one, there's this one moment where I walk in and I'm supposed to walk a certain way or not slam my feet. I don't remember. And I would, right before they would say action, I would think, okay, pick up your feet. Don't don't make the like, don't make that sound that's bothering the the sound department. And every time, five times in a row, I completely forgot as soon as they said action. Yeah. Because it's hard to think about the real life at the same time when you're like, okay, I'm in the character. I'm playing this person now. And I literally, I, even though I just reminded myself like 10 seconds before they said action, I couldn't remember to pick up my feet a certain way. Yeah. It can be hard sometimes, but, you know. With actors, it's, uh, you don't get together for fun and read lines, you know? You don't get to get together for fun. Hey, what are you doing this weekend? You know, let's read a play together. But musicians, it's, hey dude, you know, we're gonna be down at, you know, um, whatever rehearsal hall, hall down here in the valley and and we're gonna jam and so so this i'm not saying that musicians aren't competitive they are but it's more about the creation of the content of the song it's about the song so everybody loves um to get together to make music um acting is a bit competitive I know that the most successful actors that I've worked with, and I won't have to name any names, um, that they can be very friendly and cooperative, and then once they put the clapper and say right. action, they would step on your throat yeah. to, to uh, beat you in a, in a scene. That, that, and it was, it was so funny to me because 
the, the education that I received when I was studying to be an actor was that you, you play with one another, yeah, that you're absolutely. scene partners, that if I'm a good tennis player and the person that I'm playing against is not very good, what I have to do is try to improve their game because I'm not going to be able to have a good game and show you how good a player I am if the other player can't hit the ball yeah. back to me. So if I'm just smashing the ball and making the person run all over the place, the, the, uh, it's just it, it's, it's not going to work that you want to try to make the scene as best as possible. Acting, I feel like you've got to use whatever stimuli, whatever stimuli you can grab onto to sort of like get you into a scene. I, I remember working on Sons of Anarchy and uh, I had known a couple of the guys on the set and I did a guest star. And then halfway through the day, um, I walked over to where they were all kind of hanging out. And I won't mention <laughs> which one of the guys but he goes, get out of here. This isn't your scene. And I was like, what? He's like, it's like get, get out of here. This isn't your scene. And we were about to do a scene together. And I was like, hurt, you know? And like a couple of the other actors were like, oh, don't worry about it. It's okay. You know, it's, don't, don't, don't take it personally. So I walked away and I was like, you know, and then it got me going, you know? And then I used it in the scene and then ba 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 and you get there. So it worked, not something I would do um, to another actor. However, um, you know, however it, it, it comes out, and sometimes you gotta take it there in order to go somewhere else. No, I wouldn't say I'm attracted to dangerous characters. I'm, I'm attracted to characters that have conflict, because for me, it's always more interesting than a character that hasn't got conflict, and it's more real. And uh, so a, a character that's grappling with something is always much more interesting to play because you've got more than one thing to play all the time. And this film certainly falls into that bracket because he's a father estranged from his son who's trying to make a go of it and trying to do the right thing. And it's very difficult in his circumstances and he's got certain demons he's dealing with. But, you know, so it certainly falls into the bracket of, you know, a character in conflict. And it wasn't from the standpoint that I have to play a character that everyone admires. You know, I love playing villainous roles, but, um, no villain ever thinks of themselves as evil. Uh, they did the right thing in their estimation, but uh, there's no getting around. He did something that terrifies any parent, you know, that's like their worst fear. Uh, but again, that wasn't so as important in the largest scheme of things. I was just trying to understand a person that would do that. And I think Jane Addams, who plays my wife, does a lot in making you understand their relationship and how controlling and aggressive she is. Uh, but she brings a lot more to the table than, than's in the script, so we were really lucky to have her. As an actor, um, there's a lot in football as far as just the preparation um, that really got me ready for acting, you know, just the way that I knew. I had to be a student and I had to study and I had to train and then at the moment where we said go, I had to throw all of that away and just go off instinct and um, that's acting, you know. So I just used a lot of the same tools that I did in football and just brought it over to acting and do the same things. First of all, um as an actor, you always want to go for being present. You, you don't want to act, and the moment you act, I would say whenever I act in the film, you say cut, always, because you can see it instantly, that's his eye. Um, so I would always go and try, my goal for all films is to be present, but, but, but especially with Tobias' films, it's, it's difficult because he creates some surroundings that are so realistic. That's why we use soldiers who have served in Afghanistan and Iraq, so we can keep this nerve and this r realism that, that creates uh, a natural flow, flow of character and story. So I know as a, as a trained actor what to do and what not to do because these guys have done it between 10 and 15 years. So it's actually a gift. And that's the reason why he, in my case, hates acting when I'm acting, but it's different with other actors. I love seeing all these people now that, you know, they're all surfers. Um, you know, Matthew McConaughey, but I understand why I do because uh, you can only be in the moment. It's like rock climbing. I used to be a rock climber as well. You can only be in the moment when you're doing that, or you're going to get, in, you're just going to wipe out uh, in, in not such a good way. Uh, and one has to 
feel the, the motion of the nature of the beast that you're on. And uh, so, yeah, I learned a lot, a lot about endurance and, and keeping my eyes open, yeah. certainly. I think a great actor is someone who can feel as they listen. Because a lot of the best moments, I think, happen when you're not talking. Your response to another person is something that can feed them in a way that just having your line when it's your turn to speak doesn't. You know, you can, I can see it happen. It, I, I've been on both sides of the giving and the receiving of that, where you, you have your moment and what I do, what, just what my response to you, what my eyes say, what my body says, is I can see the other person going deeper into what it is that they want to say because they, they know that they are being heard. And it is a natural kind of symbiotic thing. A wonderful quote from either Julie Harris, a fantastic actress, or Helen Hayes, another fantastic actress, um, was this. She, there was a, she was doing a play on Broadway and she had to do it night after night after night for months and months and months. And there is a scene in which she comes downstage and sits on a park bench and has a moment and weeps. And someone came up to, and they're talking about the scene and what she's thinking and all that. And the person says to her, uh, the interviewer says, how can you cry every night? And she says, how can you not? Because, and that was the end of the quote, was how can you not? But because she was in that moment, she was feeling that feeling. She was hearing those words or feeling that feeling. And how can you not respond to that if you're really hearing? So that's what I think makes a wonderful actor is being able to um, hear and feel uh, whether you're talking or not. All of us are everything. And people say, well, how can you say that? Uh, I'm a woman with a child. I'm not a murderer. Okay. Suppose somebody just came up and hit your baby in the head with a hammer. <laughs> What would you call your response to that if you pick that hammer up? No one's saying you're a murderer. No one's saying you're anything, but you're everything. And if you're hired to do a job, the director doesn't hire you to act like that person. The director hires you to become that person. And that's something that most people don't understand about acting. Acting is not, I don't, that word is annoying because it means you're pretending. Acting is not pretending. Acting is becoming. It's surrendering to the spirit of whatever your, that character you're describing is. It's a thing called stage fright. That's when you're in the middle. Uh, you've given part of yourself up to be the character, but your ego and your fear and paranoia is watching how you give it up and tries to control the shape of that giving up. But real actors, like the ones that I adore, and the Kate Winslets and the Meryl Streeps and the Denzels when he's really in it and the Sam Jacksons and the um, Philip Seymour Hoffmans and the Jeffrey Wrights and uh, when those people go there, there's no there's nobody there <laughs> except that character, and that's admirable. It takes courage, and people don't understand because sometimes you're not in control. You're 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 on a ride. <laughs> If the trust and the person you trust is the director to say, did I ride right? What do you think? Because uh, you don't stand outside and look at your ride. 
uh, you ride. And that's what real great actors do. The main thing I say is I would never ask an actor to do something I couldn't do. And I'm not the best actor in the world. I'm a decent actor, but I'm not the best. The people who I get, who I ask to play these parts, they are all better than me at what they're doing, at the part that they're doing. So I know if I can do the, make the transition I asked them to make or play an emotion in the scene, I know they can do it because I, I can do it. I would never ask them to do something I couldn't do. Certainly, you know, I've, I've been on both sides of that equation. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm an actor as well, so I, and, and I find that, I, I find that the more, the more delicate uh, a director uh, tries to be, the more frustrating it is for, for everyone uh, involved. I, f I find uh, th the more direct you can be and the less you can say, the better, the better you are, the, be the better it is for everybody. Interesting. So you're not sort of tiptoeing around trying to no, be just, just, someone's just be really. direct okay. and concise. Uh, you know, I, I, I find uh, me as a director, and may, and maybe it's because I, I you know, I'm, I'm so, you know, I, I, I understand the secret language of actors because I'm one as well. But I, I can go up and just say one word to an actor, um, and 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 they'll go, oh, oh, got it, okay, good, and and that's it. Like the 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 less you can say, the better. God, learn learn an American accent. Just do it because there's so many Australians that I know who come over. And I'll talk to them and I'll say, oh, have you got your American accent down? And they'll say, oh, no, 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 but I'm, you know, I'll get to that eventually. And I feel like almost before you should even arrange any papers or before you should even book a flight or just consider, before it should be a twinkle in your eye, the idea of living here, moving here, you should have an American accent down, I feel like. But, uh, yeah, it's, it was fairly natural. I don't deserve any credit for it if it is, if it is convincing. Uh, I've been here for six years, I ought to have it down by now, but I think I had pretty much down when I first moved here because I, in Australia, uh, and I've made the joke before, but I honestly think it's because I, I grew up like slightly racist, you know, in a slightly racist Australian environment, you know, because we make fun of everyone. It's, you know, and so I was growing up doing Indian, Scottish, Irish, American accents. I'm pretty sure my first word in an American accent was cheeseburger, <laughs> if that gives you any idea of what, what I'm getting at. Okay. So, uh -huh. Yeah, I think it was always there. And then I just, I had to professionalize it, if you catch my drift. Difficult for me. For us, it was yeah. a really tough camera shot too, because there's a really lot of long takes in that one and a lot of movement. So that was like another challenge. But so that was a really challenging one, and therefore one of the most fun to shoot. Yeah, it's hard when it's not only physically uh, exhausting. You know, like it's a, we had to move around a lot, but also emotionally exhausting. You put those two together when we're shooting till like 3 a.m. and you don't even realize where the time goes and you're just so tired. Yeah, we were, after that scene, we were so, like, drained. We were, yeah. yeah. But then you also have that moment, you're just also proud. You have that moment of accomplishment. Like, okay, I feel like we got it. We yeah. Got it, you know? I had a dream of, 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 you know, I wanted to, even when I did uh, Nightwatch, I'd already uh, been accepted to a, a theater school in, in England. So I was, I was, yeah, I just finished four years of training in Denmark, then I was going to do this movie and then go to Bristol Vic. You know, where Daniel Day-Lewis had gone, it was very exciting. I went there for two weeks and then I ran away. Um, but I always wanted to, 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 to act and I wanted to, to travel the world if I could. Um, so that was the plan. Then I moved to London and then slowly but surely I started getting work. Back in May of 1987, did you almost not take that thing? Yeah, absolutely not. There was no way that I wasn't going to take it. No, 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 no. I, uh, I came out here and... Um, Shortly thereafter, um, I got what at the time was probably my biggest break, which was uh, playing the heavy in Karate Kid 3, and I, I got it uh, from an open call, standing in line with 1,500 other people, and John Avelson, who had won the Academy Award for Rocky, uh, picked me out of a line, and uh, I wound up being cast, and, and that really, you know, that really changed the, the trajectory of my career. I was doing my parents' dreams. I was, <laughs> I did finance. I worked, at, uh, yeah, the banking world. And what happened? I blew it. I'll tell you what happened. I, no, I got laid off right around 9-11. Uh -huh. And I already had used up all my vacation days. I knew that I was just a horrible investment banker. I just, I hated it. Why? And I knew it wasn't going to last. I don't know. I just wasn't, I, I, you know, I knew at that point in my life that I had to at least try something that I cared about. And that began the journey of me kind of like, Spending a year going and doing a lot of crazy stuff, and it eventually 
after a while, I was in LA, I was bartending, I was thinking I'll go to law school, and I got asked to do an audition, and next thing you know, I was a full-time actor. Wow. It was crazy. I feel like, like you do actually kind of have to ignore your parents and your family when they discourage you from doing what you want to do. I well, did your parents, did they actually want you to do something besides comedy? Was there a specific thing that they, they wanted? My dad would just always say, like, you know, this, in, in a very supportive way, you know, this might parlay nicely into advertising, this whole comedy thing. And I'd really? be like, no, no, this is it. This wow. is the plan. Like, this is going well. Wow. You know, like when I was making, like, I don't know, 500 bucks a week, driving my mom's station wagon around the country, opening for bigger comedians, like, I was like, success like in my mind i was like that's i don't know how that much was that, the dream what does yeah. that average out to a year is that that's like twenty six thousand twenty six thousand dollars a year i was like fine great like if i can pay my rent i'll do this for the rest of my life i had this experience when my parents are the uh, i said i've said this before and it makes them upset but it's true they're the only jews in america who don't like public broadcasting and they completely disapproved of me working in public radio in my 20s and were constantly trying to get me to go to medical school which they only stopped like after I was in my mid-thirties. I feel like my parents wanted me to go to something like medical school, but not medical school, because then I could have the potential to hurt people. <laughs> like, <laughs> ma like I botch a surgery, or you know what I mean, because I'm so clumsy. Like they kind of knew, like, you should go to medical school. Maybe not medical school. Yeah. You know what I mean? Something like medical school. Something stable and academic, but maybe well, not something where you're money. touching people's innards. Yeah. I just got out of high school trying to figure out what I want to do. And, uh, well, I kind of knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to act in some capacity. So I started really just Googling acting schools, acting stuff, anything that encompassed acting, trying to find a, a sort of channel in. And so I just Googled everything, and pages and pages of things popped up, and I just filled everything out. And then eventually, you know, people started answering. And a lot of those were scams and things that I would ultimately end up wasting my time on. And so I ended up going back and forth from uh, L.A. to Victorville, scrambling up change. And uh, One time, it was a school for modeling and career, and career center, modeling career center. And so they had us get up on the runway, taught us to walk the runway, and taught us all the names of the brands, like Fendi, Gucci, Prada, all these th different things that would be of no use to me, really. But at the time... I realized every other week they had uh, agents come in for the people that wanted to aspire to get into acting. So I wanted to get in front of one of these agents. And when one of those agents came through, I said, oh, I want to go in. This is audition day. It was like every Thursday or something like that. And they said, well, do you have anything prepared? I said, yes. And I didn't. But I went in anyway. <laughs> and I just did the first thing that came to my mind, which was basically just to jump up, up, up on the chair and be like, totally get in a minute and do some random stuff. And the guy saw something in me that he liked. Well, I don't know. And he signed me to his uh, commercial agency. From there, I began to do auditions and fail and learn what it meant to be uh, rejected, but be in the room and sort of build my comfortability over time. So it would prove to be a very important chapter, although at the time I just thought it was like I was wasting my time. But uh, it proved to be very important once I got out there and really started auditioning. I felt comfortable because I had been rejected and I'd been through all of it already, so there's nothing left to fear. So yeah, that was what came of the internet. Do you feel like you're living your calling? Yeah, I do. I definitely do. You know, back when I was younger, I thought my calling was to be a midwife and deliver babies, um, which has been a passion of mine since I was as, as long as I can remember. And that's what I really thought I was going to do until I literally just got a job in acting. I never went to school or did anything. And once I started doing this, I was like, whoa, like this, I can't imagine myself doing anything else. So now I'm just going to have my own babies and just continue to be an actress. <laughs> did you receive signs along the way? I mean, I know that's like out You know there, what, no, you Natalie, I, I do believe in signs. And, and, you know, looking back, I do kind of believe that I was put in certain situations and times where a lot of people aren't. Like I was hanging out with people in the industry, huge names, when I was like 17 years old. You know, I was put in places and, and things have happened in my life that allow me to be where I'm at right now. And I find all those to be signs. I definitely, that's the only reason why I'm here is because I followed those signs. And when opportunity knocked, I opened every single one of those doors. And then an interesting sort of uh, audition story that I, I tell a lot. Um, again, this is something I, I learned uh, when the Fast and the Furious audition came my way. Again, 
where I was at in my time at that time in my life, I didn't realize what I had. I was off in my own sort of thinking about what I, I, I thought about the business. I got the audition and it was called Redline actually at the time. And I, I remember passing on the audition and uh, why? Because I just didn't want to. I, I, I had in my mind I wanted to do something completely different with my life at the time. Again, maybe 23 years old, you know. So I got the audition. I passed. Got the audition twice. I passed, right? My agent at the time calls me up and says, what are you doing? Like, you really want to pass on this? And I said, yeah. I mean, I was just being a little punk. She's like, fine. Hung up the phone on me. I'm like, yeah. Right, I'm, I'm making these de decisions. <laughs> Another agent from the same agency called me up and he said, Chad, you know, come on, go in, go in, just go in. I'm like, okay, I'll go in. I was being a brat, I was being a, a brat. And I went and I auditioned and I, I met the director, Rob Cohen, he's very friendly and, and so nice and uh, the casting director who, who I love and, and uh, so I auditioned and, and they liked what I did. And then they called me back or they want me to come back and read with a couple of the other actors. And so I'm like, all right. And then you start to like sort of play it in your mind. You're like, oh, oh, you like me? Okay, <laughs> you know, all right, yeah, yeah, I'll go back in. Yeah, sure. So I go in and I read with, um, well, I think it was Matt Schultz at the time and, uh, and Johnny Strong, I believe. And they were trying to fit like the guys that you know, because they already had you know uh, Paul and Vin and everybody. And um, I ended up booking this movie. I got the part, and and I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And we're gonna do all these cars, and then we got on set, and it became, you know, this crazy thing. And everyone's gonna be like, oh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be huge. It's gonna be this big movie. And I'm like, no, I just don't, I don't, I don't think so, guys. <laughs> I was just so locked into this, into this brain of mine. And then, uh, lo and behold, it became like. A huge phenomenon it changed my life instantly and it taught me again that you never 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 know uh, don't don't turn down an audition don't don't be silly you know and I was really silly and I tell this story and not that I, I, I am so appreciative <laughs> that I went in and I, and I was given that opportunity and uh, it changed my life forever forever so um, I learned a, a valuable lesson then you know just you know keep your mind open you know, appreciate what you have. If it comes when you're 19, if it comes when you're 40, just appreciate that moment. So, uh, one of my early jobs was um, on Fantasy Island, and uh, I was uh, among a retinue of young women, you know, uh, uh, that were surrounding this older man who was uh, the, the star, the guest star of the show, and um, so we broke for lunch. And one of the other women, I, I had lines, this other woman didn't have lines, but she, we, we were walking to lunch and she was a, a goddess. I mean, she was so beautiful and very sweet and really lovely. And we were just talking and I liked her right away. And then she started to tell me about her husband. And immediately I got this overwhelming sense of dread on her behalf. I mean, I have chills now even remembering it. And um, he had... She'd been working at a Dairy Queen in Canada or something, and, and he'd, he was older than she, and he spotted her, and he saw what she was, and he got her into Playboy, and she had a, a, a you know, Playboy centerfold spot. And, and um, she, the more she talked about him, the creepier I felt about this guy. But, you know, we, we just met each other. What am I going to say about her husband? You know, you better watch out for him. And, and then I learned that she was with my agency, and then about a week or a month later, two months later maybe, I'm walking with my agent to an audition and he tells me that this woman just got a part in a major motion picture. Now I have been a, the a classically trained actress since I was two years old. And she had just blown into town. Now she was a goddess, I have to give you that, and Hollywood you know, eats that up. But I was so jealous. I couldn't believe it. I was so, just churning with envy inside and resentment and, and it would, oh, it felt like it was awful. And about two months after that, I was going to um, New York. I had a play that I was taking to New York that I wanted to shop around a bit. And I'm walking home and I see um, 
a headline, you know, beauty queen slain. And I thought, oh, it was some, you know, Miss New Jersey or something. I didn't pay any attention. I called my agents to find out what was going on, if I should come her early. And they said, oh, we're just so worried. We're just so upset about Dorothy. And I put on my oh, best, my best, I tried my best to care. And I went, oh, really? Why? And she said, didn't you hear? Her husband just shot her in the face and murdered her because she was drifting away from him. And it was Dorothy Stratton who was the subject of that film, Star 80. Right. And even now, you see, that the, I was so oh my ashamed gosh. of myself for begrudging her one moment of celebrity or joy because I had no idea right. what lay before her and I had no idea what she went through to get that, to get there, to, to her moment in the sun. Yeah. And how dare I, how dare I? And that was, I, I, I was more affected by, what, what, by her death and what it called up in me than I was when my own grandfather died because I was so ashamed of my jealousy. Sam Jackson, I was dying to get his respect. Um, probably, you know, I mean, he's definitely a, a great mentor, you know, only second to my grandfather, you know. Um, but th this man knows everybody's lines. He knows everybody's lines. He knows where the camera moved, on what line, and where he did what, and he knows everything. It's really amazing. So, I, um, in rehearsals, <clears throat> in rehearsals, Samuel, uh, I know he was teaching me a lesson. We've had this conversation before, so. <laughs> He's got these giant monologues at the end of the film that are actually much bigger than what even ended up in the film. And in rehearsals, he, Kevin Reynolds was like, hey, are hey, you, you, you guys ready to, to do this scene? I'm like, yeah, man, let's, let's do it. And Sam looks up and he's like, yeah, man. And he throws the scenes on the floor. <laughs> Sam threw them because he doesn't need them. <laughs> He's got the big speeches anyway. So I'm like holding my gun and then he just like looks up at me, got tears. He can control this side and this side too, by the way. He can make this cry right now. He can make this cry. He can hold them. I can't do that, but he can. <laughs> um, so when I saw him holding the tears and he literally just put the pedal to the metal and I thought, oh my God, I, I don't know if I can ever be that good. So I, I just remember uh, just racing home, racing home and just del delving as deeply as I could just to get any ounce of respect from him. Yeah, he, he's a tough love kind of guy. So you gotta really, really, really earn it. But I remember one scene where I thought, okay, I now accept the destiny of me also being a director. Um, it was on a hijacking. Mm -hmm. We were um, in the office of the ship. Pilu had a gun stuck to his back head. And it was just a test. We didn't, even, we didn't even want to shoot it, it was just a camera test, how can we cover this? But I could detect that Pilu was there. We'd spent now a month on the ship, sailing in the Indian Ocean, surrounded by pirates, so it was real. And mm. suddenly, I could see Pilu's here, let's just go. So I whispered to everybody, let's shoot this. And it ended up with you calling your wife live back in Denmark on the satellite phone, us tapping that line and doing the whole yeah. thing. And it's not in the script but you just went crazy and attacked the pirate. Mm. And in doing that, you hit your head, but I couldn't see that. So I just said, keep rolling. <laughs> and Pilou was on the floor, you know, crying. And I thought, he's so fucking great. Wow, this is not acting, this is real. <laughs> and then suddenly I could see blood on the floor. I was like, uh-oh, we don't have special effects on today, what the fuck is going on, you know? And I realized that the whole thing from him attacking the pirate and on was real. No. He bumped his head and he was split open. Yeah. And there was so much blood all over the place. But I didn't stop it because, you know, I thought, oh, he's so present. <laughs> and after that, I was like, okay, I have to take control of being a director. I cannot risk the security of people. Let's go. Let's, let's, be, let's be professional about this. <laughs> that was cool. That was a cool scene. It was an amazing scene. Yeah. And it became the midpoint of that film. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I think the, the biggest satisfaction that I have 
is when e each, each scene has what the scene is about, but then there's this little nuance that has to do with what the character is really going through. And it usually has to do with his, this motivation that he has that no one else knows. He's trying to get close to someone. He's trying to introduce someone to someone. It's not the obvious thing. And seeing, Norm, seeing Richard grab on to that small nuance and bring it to life and express it in some way was incredibly satisfying to me because it's as if he was revealing this secret about what really goes through Norman's head. I remember him directing me. I'm flashing on one of the early scenes. It's actually the first scene that's in the movie. And I'm, uh, I'm approaching Dan Stevens in the park. And I got a deal that I'm trying to convince him. I remember we were doing the shot as we as he moves away because he basically does it. No <laughs> one wants anything to do with this Norman or any Norman. It's it's how do you make them stop without using losing your own dignity in making them stop? Yeah, <laughs> and you see that a lot with characters in this movie who just they don't want to have to say go away, leave me alone. It's it's some level of please enough. So I'm chasing, I'm chasing, and we're doing a, a, a steady cam shot. And he's saying, I remember this direction was, you know, maybe you could just kind of bob behind him <laughs> and try to get his attention while well, you're coming behind. And it, it was so, I mean, I got it immediately, what you were talking about. And that ended up informing much of what I did in the film, this sense right. of... Pe peeking, peeking over someone's <laughs> shoulder to, and just waving, I'm still here, is... is Hi. Seeing Richard Gere do that is incredibly satisfying. <laughs> and I got a call from my agents when I landed in Houston and said they wanted to reroute me to uh, New Orleans, that I'd been offered this role in the Dallas Buyers Club, but I needed to be there the next day. And I said, Mitchell, he said, he said in the first place, and he never does this, he said, say yes. And I said, do me a favor, I'll read the script on the next leg from Houston to Birmingham, and I'll call you when I land, but I gotta get home, I gotta see my kids. And he said, okay, but they're gonna turn you right around and you're gonna go back to New Orleans. Uh, and he, and he, the last thing he said was, say yes. So, because he knew the, he knew the project. And um, I, when I got there, uh, because I was drawn in a little bit late, um, a lot was, there were a lot of moving parts. And there's this wonderful, uh, crazy French-Canadian director, Jean-Marc Vallée. I adored working with him. Uh, I'll be forever grateful for the, for the notes that he gave me because he, he gave my character dimension that I might have missed. I was stepping in quickly to something. And, but when I walked into the, into the hospital room the first time to work with Matthew, I was like, when's he coming in? Uh, you know, and he's, of course, he's more than ready. He's standing over there, but he had lost so much weight that he was unrecognizable to me. So. <laughs> So we, when we started the scene, I'm still waiting for McConaughey to come in, and he's there. And uh, it, it, you know, it's one of those things that kind of throw you in the moment when you finally realize, uh oh, we're going, and you better catch up. So it, it actually helped me because we were we were in the in the throes of it before I had an opportunity to get nervous about it. So I was doing a movie called Push years ago and Chaz Palminteri was uh, in the movie and in the movie he kind of plays like my father figure and we all know Chaz Palminteri is a great actor, tall, intimidating man, very, very generous, very nice. So in this scene I am supposed to come in and tell him that I lost all this money and I need help and I need, I need, I need him to bail me out of this life or death situation. So I kept coming into the scene, I'm supposed to be crying and this, and I wasn't bringing it, period. I was stinking up the room, and I couldn't get there. And so, all right, maybe, you know, take five or whatever. I come in, and I'm like, oh, da, da, da. and he goes, what'd you say? He grabs me, pulls me to him, and goes, slaps me across the face. Wham! Like this, the whole set, you can hear a pin drop. And I was like, ah. <laughs> and I started crying. He goes, what'd you say? He goes, come here. And he grabs me again, slaps me again. And the man's got hands, you know, wham. And I'm like, oh my God. And then I started to cry and started to get into it. And before you know it, I'm like, ah, da, da, da. And, I, and then cut, director yells, cut. He's like, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And I go outside and I bawl. 
cried and I cried and I cried because I just got my ass handed to me by a football player in this business, right? And I went inside and Chaz, he, he, he grabbed me and he pulled me in and he gave me a big, huge hug. And he goes, don't take it personally, kid. He goes, De Niro slapped me. And if you go back and you watch, I think it was um, a Bronx tale. And in a scene, they're slapping each other or, or De Niro slaps them or something like that. And they would keep doing that back and forth until they actually got into the scene. So I felt it was a huge honor that he trusted me enough to slap me. <laughs> and then he told us the story on Conan because uh, Conan was like, do actors get intimidated of you? And he was like, yeah. And he started to tell the story about how he slapped me. And, um, but we got there. So he was sensitive to me. And, and, and he was also being very generous in, in helping me. It wasn't about him. And I think that's something that we need to do as actors is, is, is be generous to the other actor because if, if you, we both need to look good. <laughs> you know, it's not all about me and my coverage and this and that. No, like we need to be generous to the other actor. We need to stand there and while they're doing their coverage and give them their lines because it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. Do the work, do the work. Do the work. Um, I'm, I, I, and, it, and it's funny because you go into certain projects, you know, with Annette Harris, like on Westworld, and in, in this film as well. Um, but I already won Ed's respect in this film, and in Westworld <laughs> I had not. So, you know, I called a few friends that had worked with him just to find out a little uh, background on him, and then um, I just studied really hard. I studied really hard to learn my lines. I studied hard to learn his lines just in case he was like, what's my line? Wow. You know, I had to be able to like, I think, I think you say, -da -ba -da 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 -da. <laughs> maybe. Just, just, I don't know how, you never know how he's gonna take it. Like he's got to navigate. Sure. So I'm navigating and um, and he goes, oh, thanks partner, all right. So I did that and then I slammed the scene where my daughter, my wife gets killed. And then he came running over to me and just pointing at me and filth and froth and just like, yes, yes, yes. And he freaking kicks me in my shin, like real hard. And he goes, that's how you do it. And then when he walked away, I was like, well, I hope that's going to leave a mark. That's what Ed Harris did to me because he did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty rad. That's cool. It's pretty awesome. So that's how I got his respect. <laughs> when it comes to playing, I really uh, e equate um, live music with live theater and filmmaking with being in the studio because you know it's a controlled you know even in a qu case like um, cop car which was you know a lot of things having to do with elements and a, and a really pared down crew and and kids and you know kids driving cars and guns and all that kind of stuff um you you, you you still have take two, and it is a relatively controlled kind of situation. And that's what the music studio is like. You know, you can do another pass on a vocal. You know, you can you know put a overdub something on. It's it's kind of like the same editing process. Sure, and the tour bus experience. Tour bus experience is um, <laughs> tour bus experience is sort of unlike anything that I've done in the films uh, because I don't tend to share a dressing room with nine other smelly <laughs> guys for a month at a time. <laughs> Generally, even if my dressing room is small, I'm still not sharing it with nine guys and sleeping in a bunk and you know all all that comes with that. The thing is, like, there are uh, people who are doing all of these things kind of for you. Like, we wrote a script, right. and then our producers, I imagine, got that in the hands of either your daughter or your repre your representation. Probably my daughter. And then you had the chance to read. She runs everything. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> we were fortunate in that one of our producers is friends with Chelsea, so. Is that right? Right? That is correct. I don't know. She's over here. Oh, okay. Oh, great choice. <laughs> yeah, awesome choice. But we can still do the role play. Okay, let's do it. Let's uh, do it. I mean... Here, here's, here's what it would have been like. Um, hey, uh, hey, uh, Billy over at Lonely Island, uh, can you get this, or, or Will over at Lord & Miller, can you get this script over to Chelsea Hamill to potentially get it to Mark Hamill? <laughs> we'll do our best. Okay, thank you. <laughs> And I imagine you get a phone call or an email. Send me a deal memo. I don't care about the script. I just want to know how much I can make. Do I get any back end? I only care no, about no. the money. It's, believe me, at this point in my career, 
the script is everything. Well, you know, honestly, like that's something that I was the most nervous about um, when I read the script, and, and then we, Adam and I spoke. He said, "You know, we're going to wear these prosthetics." I actually was not nervous about the, to. I mean, obviously, I was on some level to wear this prosthetic, right. but the applying of the prosthetic was where my mind went to first. Like, what are the steps that go into that? Um, because I don't want to make anyone feel um, like they regret their life. Yeah. And um, and uh, it's just you know. And I had my wife like talk to me before, like, what do I do? How do I? Anything I should do? Like, you know, they it's it's there's a lot of glue, um, and so you just got to make sure that it's um, yeah, it's a wonderful. It was a wonderful time. Sure, very delicately. It was applied. a strange time. Yeah, right. it was a strange time in my life. And then, as we were getting closer to shooting, we got uh, luckily got Jason to agree to do it. Mm -hmm. I was so I couldn't believe that I got this opportunity. Well, oh, we were so lucky to get I had a this th guy. I had a thing where I was like literally like this is too good. There's there's got to be some catch that they're they're miss seeing some. I was so excited. I couldn't believe the how catch funny was it. you would have to be naked with the prosthetic. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I guess when you put it that's it that way. The catch. <laughs>